<clears throat> Thank you all so much for joining us. We now have the pleasure to begin our panel on frameworks for digital economies of the future. Um, you are welcome to submit questions in the Q&A tab under the chat on the side. The moderator, Jeff Bandman of GDF, will uh, take them, time permitting. And I will now cede the stage to Jeff to introduce himself. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, and uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm Jeff Bandman, uh, founding board member of Global Digital Finance, uh, which is an international policy organization dedicated to promoting the uh, adoption of uh, digital finance through convening an international community to raise higher international standards around codes of conduct and shared understandings. Uh, we have a wonderful collaboration with uh, Global Blockchain Business Council, and we're thrilled to support and be part of this uh, event. And some of my GDF colleagues are also uh, actively part of this conference as well. Uh, really uh, excited about today's uh, panel discussion on um, digital transformation. Um, Digital transformations are redefining our economy, industries, and business models. According to the World Economic Forum, an estimated 70% of new value created in the economy over the next decade will be on digitally enabled platforms. As countries and com companies grapple with the coronavirus pandemic, and we'll be absolutely asking our panelists about that, the rate of digitization has accelerated. As we look to create the digital economies of the future, the need for robust digital infrastructure and processes is undeniable. Recent tech advantages and innovations such as blockchain are enabling organizations and companies alike to challenge existing business models and create new opportunities for value creation and capture for all. So we have a really fantastic all-star international panel, and I'll go to them uh, individually, ask them to uh, introduce themselves and tell us a bit about themselves, uh, and then we'll jump into the uh, panel discussions. And we very much welcome the questions from the audience, have the... Uh, the Q&A panel open, so I look forward to hearing from you as well. Uh, we'll start with uh, Kairat Kaliev, uh, Chief Development Officer at Astana International Financial Center. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, hi to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, participate in this uh, uh, interesting uh, topic discussion. Uh, my name is Karat Khalif. I, as, as Jeff said, I'm Chief Development Officer at uh, AFC. AFC is a, a inter Astana International Financial Center. Uh, uh, we are located in Kazakhstan, and um, we are um, we are developing uh, a special jurisdiction, very unique for this region, uh, based on uh, so we are uh, acting based on English common law jurisdiction. Uh, uh, similar to um, similar to probably uh, a financial center uh, developed in um, Dubai and Abu Dhabi uh, as an example <clears throat> and um, so first of all we are um, our main goal is uh, to attract uh, f foreign investments and uh, direct and portfolio and uh, second uh, our role is uh, to develop financial services um, based on um, AFC, we've uh, established a um, uh, stock exchange in partnership with NASDAQ uh, and the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Um, so we have separate uh, uh, court system, independent from Kazakh court system and integrated to it uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, we have a separate regulator, also independent from our central bank regulation. So dedicated to develop like new financial services for Kazakhstan, uh, and uh, we are planning to cover uh, all uh, CIS region here. Uh, one of our pillar, of course, is the kind of future of uh, financial services is uh, developing fintech, and uh, uh, we have a blockchain uh, pillar uh, as one of our main goals, and uh, we are uh, successfully uh, like. We have successful partnership with GBBC in terms of uh, starting international uh, pr practice, regulation, and uh, you know, developing uh, financial services uh, utilizing blockchain technologies. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, uh, Kyra. Uh, look forward to hearing, hearing more from you and bringing that perspective. 
Uh, next, uh, we'll go to uh, Santosh Misra, uh, CEO of Tamil Nadu e-governance agency. Please uh, tell us tell us about that. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Santosh Mishra. I head the e-governance agency in government of Tamil Nadu, which is one of the state large state governments of India uh, on the southern southeastern tip of India, if, uh, if you're familiar with the Indian geography. Uh, I have been, uh, the, this agency is actually a semi-autonomous agency within the government and it's responsible for doing uh, all government to government technology uh, provide solutions, also from government to citizen solutions. And we also work at evaluating new technologies and applying them to governance, to improve governance, to improve public service delivery. And that is what we do. Uh, in terms of G2C, we have a pretty large uh, spectrum. We offer about 200, I mean, essentially I call myself uh, Uber of government services. So we actually take all departments, government services, put them on our unified platform. And every year we serve about 10 million individuals in the state of Tamil Nadu. So this is what we do. And we, as uh, the relevance to the blockchain is that we are also tasked with identifying emerging technologies and applying them for governance. And this is where uh, we have been, for the last two years, we have been working on several issues, several problems, uh, where we have applied blockchain, where we have applied uh, artificial intelligence. We have a small uh, team called Center of Excellence in Emerging Technology with which we work and provide very low cost solution for, uh, for the government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, in, in the area of uh, blockchain, in fact, something very interesting is coming up. Day after tomorrow, we are releasing our blockchain policy and we are also releasing a safe and ethical AI policy for government of Tamil Nadu. So uh, that will be day after tomorrow. So with that, I think I'll uh, close and uh, look forward to uh, having a great conversation. And that's great. And you, you had mentioned maybe if you could just share a sentence with uh with our audience, you you had uh, kind of described yourself in our prep call as the kind of the tech brain of, of the uh, of the of, you know for 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 your region, uh, and it sounded also like you had a somewhat uh, a semi at least semi autonomous um, set up someone like someone like Astana International Financial Center, and you had also spoken about some uh, kiosks that you had uh, put in place. Right. Could you just uh, you know just uh, expand yeah, so on. Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I missed that. Uh, so we we basically, as I said, we are responsible for doing all the tech innovations in the government. Uh, uh, we uh, we lead, as I said. I mean, the day after tomorrow, we are coming out with our AI policy. I think ethical AI has been one of the uh, slight digression from the topic here, but ethical AI has been talked about everywhere else. But I think. Uh, putting it together in in form of a policy. I think we are one of the very few governments who are doing it. So that's the kind of role we do. Same thing with the blockchain policy. So we have, while all the governments and everywhere else have been talking about blockchain, particularly in India, I think we are the first one to actually put together all this framework and bring out something which will basically an implementation handbook, if you will, for the government. So this is what we do, that tech brain work, which you were referring. Uh, we, we are we essentially do that. Uh, in terms of, I was mentioning about G2C services. So we have about 200 services which we offer. And one of the mechanisms is of course online. So where people can access and apply online, they do deliver these services online and an SMS or a download link goes to the individual's mobile uh, handheld device. However, there is a large population which may not be comfortable doing this. So there is a digital divide and which we have tried to fulfill try to bridge that digital divide by having these about, we have about 10,000 plus kiosks, all spread all across the state. And uh, anyone can approach them. And actually those kiosk operators are the ones who will fill in your application and um, deliver your service. I mean, they will, they will become the link for delivery of your service if you choose to. So right now we about, uh, as I said, we do about 50,000 uh, uh, individuals are served every day, uh, some offline, some online. And this is what we do. That's great. Yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, adding that. That's that's great. 
Um, great. Uh, next, we'll, we'll go to uh, Rutger von uh, Ziedem, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Odyssey. Uh, tell, please tell us what, uh, what you and Odyssey are up to. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, great to be uh, in, in, in your midst. Uh, really impressive, uh, the amount of uh, attendees uh, as well in the session. Uh, looking forward to the, the great discussion uh, a, a lot. Um, Odyssey is uh, an online incubator for uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration that connects governmental, corporate, and scientific and nonprofit partners with anyone that can contribute to building open source solutions for complex 21st century challenges. Um, these kind of challenges are typically uh, challenges that cannot be solved by one organization or even uh, an entire industry, uh, but they are uh, societal issues, they are uh, systemic problems, they are multi-sectoral problems, uh, typically where you would need collaboration between entities that don't know each other and that would require certain uh, trust from the system instead of uh, the institutes. Um, and uh, with the ecosystem of well over 6,000 uh, 6, people uh, uh, worldwide, uh, we create an, an interconnected multi-stakeholder ecosystem where people discover the future by building it. It's an incubator. Normally, an incubator would, would, would focus on a startup, but this focuses on an ecosystem uh, of partners that want to solve uh, these kind of challenges together. Uh, and we've created a program for that uh, to enable to do that step by step, going from zero to one, which is the most difficult part, where at the pinnacle of that program is a, a massive co-creation event, or as we call it, a online mass collaboration arena, which we are currently building uh, in a gaming engine, uh, we we were uh, pivoting uh, last May from doing these kind of things offline uh, through events, uh, as that was the way to get people together. And now we're uh, <laughs> we're developing something no one has ever done before, uh, and doing all that stuff in a gaming engine with uh, well, I would say we have two thousand people already confirmed moving towards 3,000 3, people from all over the world uh, collaborating in, uh, in, uh, in November. So uh, that is what Odyssey is, uh, is up to. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. And uh, now we turn to uh, Michael Coletta, who's the head of blockchain and emerging tech at the London Stock Exchange Group. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Michael Coletta. Um, Greetings from our West London office. We're still working from home, the majority of us. Um, so just to give you a bit, of, a bit of background before I introduce myself and what I've been working on and doing. Um, so uh, the London Stock Exchange Group is commonly misunderstood as just the capital market, uh, but let's just uh, back up and clarify what we do. So we have a variety of financial market infrastructure businesses. So one of them is capital markets. So we, we run and own Borsa Italiana and the post-trade infrastructure in Italy. So all of the capital markets in Italy, um, the London Stock Exchange uh, group, the London Stock Exchange itself, right? That's also famous. Um, we have a um, post-trade business, the LCH. It used to stand for the London Clearinghouse, but that just focuses on risk management, central counterparty uh, risk management. Um, then one of our lesser known businesses, and actually it's quite interesting um, talking to some of the panelists and hearing their background as well, is that um, similar to NASDAQ, we also have a technology business, uh, LSEC Technology, formerly known as Millennium, um, that builds uh, infrastructure, financial market infrastructure for 11 different sovereign nations around the world, um, the largest of which but outside of the UK would be um, Singapore. Um, and then, of course, we have our data business, which is FTSE, the famous FTSE Russell, as you would know it. But um, there's a variety of other uh, products. So we basically look across the entire and look after the entire financial market infrastructure landscape. So we don't have a uh, particularly narrow view. So it's not just capital markets. It's not just post-trade, right? It's data, it's tech, it's all of that. And I think, you know, when um, listening to the background of some of the panelists as well, I think, uh, Rucker, you know, on your, um, the, the kind of cross organizational complexity, I can completely appreciate, right? Um, and I think that's the, that's the kind of the interesting part about, you know, when we think about the future and how the, you know, what we're going to discuss in this panel is um, who's best poised to kind of help make this happen, right? So, you know, is it going to be completely decentralized or not? Well, probably a bit of both, right? So 
um, we as market infrastructure providers really do perform that role today. So um, I think it's kind of incumbent upon us to really be thinking and taking advantage of what the technology is enabling. Um, just a bit of background quickly. Um, so I come from a long, <laughs> A long history of working in financial market infrastructure previous to the LSE group. I was at the CME group for 10 years, working on the launch of the Bitcoin future, a di digitization of gold project. Um, I come from a technology background originally. Um, my title is technically at uh, the London Stock Exchange head of blockchain and fintech. Um, so that's a transition away from the direct software development role. But um, I think, you know, it's it's kind of a perfect, perfect application of, you know, where tech meets business. And that's kind of how I've always been. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's me. No, that's, uh, that's great. And I'm, uh, actually an, an, uh, an LSE group alumnus, uh, having spent several years working, uh, uh, an LCH while it was still called LCH ClearNet, although, uh, yeah. that was just as LSE was, uh, kind of consummating the acquisition. Um, yeah, so yeah, such a fascinating range of businesses there. Great, and uh, I've been informed that uh, one of our uh, panelists who we were uh, counting on or hoping would join, Yvette Valdez, has been unable to, to join us today. Uh, so uh, you know, we look forward to engaging with her on these topics in the future. Uh, but you know, we've got uh, you know, four wonderful panelists to uh, enlighten us, so we'll, uh, we'll plow ahead. Uh, so let's, let's start. I'll turn, turn to you first, uh, Kairat. Um, obviously, we, uh, you know, this, this year has been a, a year of tr tremendous uh, you know, change and adjustment with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic around around the world. Um, and you know, what is what is the meaning of COVID-19 been from, from a point of view of these digital economies? Has COVID-19 brought us to an inflection point of disruption? Um, are we at the point where companies and countries uh, may now be realizing that they can't wait any longer to update their infrastructure and processes? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, the question itself, like, has an, <laughs> has an answer, uh, and it and uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, so we we, we all uh, know about like fourth and uh, fourth industrial revolution, uh, which is uh, you know, like is, is ongoing now, uh, but uh, unfortunately, so uh, as we know that not all countries uh, are ready for it and not all countries started uh, changes or doing a force for these changes and uh, <clears throat> it uh, uh, brings uh, so it we can see it now that it brings some uh, sort of segregation of society for um, uh, say let's say technology more improved and uh, uh, more let's say rich countries or, or people etc and uh, but uh, poor countries and uh, uh, and people living there so uh, cannot uh, cannot make this transformation um, as fast as, as as it needed and i think that uh, <clears throat> this covid-19 situation with all these lockdowns and quarantines etc uh, forced this uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution trend. And uh, uh, I think that uh, 2020, uh, during this COVID-19, it's kind of demo version of uh, where we are heading. Uh, and uh, we see that not all countries can handle um, these challenges. And uh, um, I see a kind of problem from one side in, in this situation, uh, uh, but from, uh, for, from another side, I see a big opportunity for th for those who uh, are ready uh, for transformation, who have resources for it, who who, who have vision, uh, and uh, uh, people uh, relevant people to do this transformation. I'm uh, I'm talking about like countries at all, and uh, I think that uh, uh, Kazakhstan is as uh, um, country like um, trying to become. Uh, a developed country, so we are, we are counting as a developed country, but we have uh, some problems of uh, uh, developing countries. And uh, during this pandemic, uh, our government faced uh, some uh, some challenges. For example, uh, with distributing uh, uh, money, uh, which uh, was like s special payment for uh, people who needed uh, support. And uh, uh, it was it was kind of challenge, but uh, and the uh, government fixed it. 
but uh, it, it's again it's um, it's clear that we have improved our um, um, infrastructure. We have improved uh, all the system uh, for uh, like for digitalization. And uh, by the way, we uh, we started what India have done. Uh, what kind of efforts they have done and uh, uh, the project, uh, uh, please, uh, Mr. Uh, Misra, uh, uh, probably correct me if I'm wrong. So, at, uh, called Adhara, right? Uh, with uh, very, uh, it's it's kind of boost of digitalization with uh, like boosting digital ID, uh, digital payment, and uh, uh, which uh, can easy easily solve uh, all social tensions uh, which can uh, force industrial revolution uh, cause. So that's why uh, I'm pretty sure and uh, it's definitely uh, 2020 with COVID-19 uh, boosted and uh, uh, forced all this uh, force, and force industrial revolution trends. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, you are muted. Yeah. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Um, yeah, no, that's 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 uh, fascinating, and you know, it's interesting that you mention, um, you know, the the one issue in particular uh, around, you know, dis distributing money to the people who needed support, you know, in, in in the wake of the pandemic and the shutdowns and lockdowns, and you know, here here in the U.S. where I'm based, again, um, you know, the the discovery was that when Structuring the, you know, the various types of relief payments, you know the, and looking at you know could there be customization based on people's needs? Uh, you know, it's discovered that you know some of the technology systems operated by the different states were, you know, not sufficiently sophisticated. You know, were kind of older legacy technology. So, you know, I'd say here in, in the U.S., uh, you know, it certainly has brought away, you know, an, an awareness uh, on a number of levels. Um, would any of the other uh, panelists like to comment on this uh, question before we move on to uh, the other ones? I I, uh, I would, uh, Jeff. Uh, um, I think, I mean, uh, uh, as a company uh, being uh, uh, dependent or having offline events where uh, thousands of people gather, uh, you experience uh, the effects of COVID uh, uh, quite well. And uh, what we've learned from that is that um, co COVID and the effects uh, that it may turn into a crisis for, for many uh, expose uh, what has been under the surface for, for a while already uh, on a systemic level. So I, I think the opportunity is that if we are open to, to what comes out from that, that we can learn a lot in what has to be changed uh, to to have a, uh, a a proper functioning uh, system or operating system, so to say, in place for our society and economy. So um, uh, with that, what you see is when you look at technology, people start, and, and we've been there too, by emulating um, what they did already offline in a, in a digital space. They, they try to emulate the same thing. Um, so that's also what you see at, uh, at a lot of uh, online events. And then when you start figuring out that, that you might not uh, use the full potential of that, then you start reinventing the whole thing. And I think that's where the big opportunity is, is that we can reinvent the things that are now uh, clear, becoming more clear to us that need reinvention so to say. And I think that's where a lot of economic opportunities is and also a lot of opportunities to, um, yeah, let's say, uh, do do a lot better uh, uh, with uh, putting resources to work and uh, uh, collaborate uh, all across the globe. Yeah, thanks. So this, those observations really, um, you know, set, set the stage for the, for the problem that's being faced and, you know, the transitioning from, you know, in-person to online, you know, collaboration, you know, you know, has presented, you know, tremendous challenges as well as opportunities. Um, for the next question, I'm going to turn to uh, Michael, um, you know, kind of given, given this, um, given some of this uh, evolution, what will the digital economies of the future start to look like? 
Yeah, so uh, thanks. Uh, so if we're, so when we were kind of thinking about um, digital economies of the future and how as a financial market infrastructure provider, we're thinking about things. I think the answer we already, the answer we almost already have, right? It, it's playing out itself. So um, what I mean by that is, and I know that you know some of the topics that we're gonna discuss here are things like platforms. Um, what's really happened is that if you look at, for example, in um, things like open banking uh, in Europe, which is basically the fact that most people aren't going to physical branches, but they're using these kind of these apps that aren't actually banks. Things like Revolut and Monzo. They're popular in they're popular in um, Europe, uh, in the states. I'm not quite sure. You know, maybe Venmo, or um, I'm not as familiar with the U.S. based ones. But if we look at it, what what's really enabled it um, is it's is APIs, right? So effectively, the ability to programmatically access services of like underlying formal infrastructure. So it's not that these apps are a front and there's nothing behind it, right? There's an actual bank that's providing the payment services. We haven't seen though, and this is the interesting part, right? And we think about digital economies of the future. With money, so with physical cash, it's a little bit easier to provide these APIs because you don't have so many layers of systems that are built up. When we look at something like financial markets, which is what we do, right? So like the, uh, securities, bonds, right? So the these essentially legal documents that are investments, um, they're a lot more complex than, you know, uh, a dollar, a euro, a pound, right? Conceptually and programmatically. Um, and I think as blo blockchain kind of proliferates, right, what it delivers is kind of a single integrated workflow. So it allows for, um, and, and this is going to be a trend that you'll see continuing to kind of um, grow. Uh, it will allow for the centralized governance, so in other words, the the rules of the system around things like the transfer of securities, right, which is where the bulk of the assets really are held, um, to move out to the endpoints and thus enabling the, the whole API piece, right? And the API piece is what enables platforms to exist. Um, and I think, you know, we have to always remember too, when we think about digital economies of the future, I think um, ICOs and crypto I would look at them like um, they are absolutely legitimate, but they are kind of a, um, they kind of are a way that we can experiment, but we can't scale necessarily. So when I, when I say that, when we think about economies of the future, we must think about scale. So, you know, it's all good and well that you can remit and make payments with a cryptocurrency. But when you take that from, let's say a billion dollars to a hundred billion dollars, and you talk about distributing it among, you know, a populace's investments, uh, I don't think any sovereign nation government is going to want to allow that to happen because that in, that introduces new types of risks. So the base we all we we don't we need to remember that we need to scale from the base. So the base of all investment that I that I'm thinking about, and I'm talking specifically digital economies and securities, bonds, capital raising, um, sits at these centralized infrastructures, right? So central banks central securities depositories, which are central banks for securities, um, and scales outward. So unless you build the foundation layer, right, and have that in place, it won't scale. So while cryptocurrency can give us a kind of a de demonstration of what the digital economy of the future can be, the actual scalable version of that is going to be a bit more, um, a little bit more centralized in a governance perspective, not decentral, not fully decentralized. So um, I think it's all about platforms. It's about enabling APIs, um, the free flow of data, and then essentially um, the fact that we have these kind of, I call them new plane, a plane of competition, right? So like the phone opened up the plane of competition for the app store, right? So the ability for, um, you know, individuals to access uh, internet and services on a device and for uh, app developers to hook into APIs and provide new business models, right? Uber, Revolut, right? Airbnb. But scale is important. Now that's a uh, it's a great perspective and a really nice uh, illustration at the uh, at the end, a transformative platform. Uh, other other people uh, wish wish to comment on this topic. Other other panelists. That's for me. Okay, um, so how, and I'm gonna turn next to uh, Santosh. Um, you know, how can we ensure uh, a better, more inclusive future uh, as, as we all look to update these uh, infrastructure and digital uh, strategies? Seems like something that you've got a lot of uh, hands-on experience with. 
Yeah, Jeff. Uh, uh, technology and uh, keeping it inclusive is a real challenge. And uh, uh, particularly a technology like blockchain, uh, which is not really well understood by people at large. And I think even amongst the experts, I think there is always, I mean, the more you read, the more you realize that you don't know. And uh, ensuring that these technologies, see, for example, that kiosk thing we were talking about. So, I mean, while it is very easy to design a system, uh, have a bank like Revolut, which uh, uh, Michael was referring to, but the question is, where do you, I mean, are you able to connect? And particularly, I'm talking about Indian context, and <clears throat> maybe I can speak of uh, countries which are in the similar developmental stage, where there's a large population of people who are actually uh, not necessarily, either they don't have a reliable access to internet, or they have access to internet, but they're not tech savvy enough. And that's where I think these emerging technologies, they pose a challenge. At the same time, they also pose a solution also. So, for example, when we were talking about our systems of delivery of government services, one of the most natural things to do is to actually integrate this on a voice interface. So if you can actually use the natural language processing and technologies like uh, uh, AI for, for this, and you can actually make the people express themselves or convey their needs or make their requests in those uh, formats in those features which they are very naturally uh, accustomed to or very naturally used to. For example, I mean, you know, I mean, mobile phone, he was uh, uh, interestingly talking about this uh, uh, new plane of competition. I like that terminology a lot. Uh, but but then you have these fat finger syndrome. So I mean, you know, the, the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to actually type something accurately. I mean, if you are filling up a complex form, if you are wanting a particular complex service, you need to ensure that these things are uh, made, the interface is made so natural, intuitive, that people are able to access it. So like kiosk thing I was telling you, we have these 200 services, all of them are available. But if you look at the number of people when we were doing an analysis, and the number of people who are using it uh, in an online mode, it's it's very small. I mean, it's about 20% people are using it online and 80% people actually go and want to have this uh, the services delivered to them through a physical mode. So, uh, I think one of the advantages of blockchain, and that's why we we are particularly are. I mean, I I got very fascinated by it. It has uh, seen India. In fact, uh, uh, Kaira was talking about uh, Aadhaar. So Aadhaar is so you have this trinity of uh, jam we call. It. Uh, so which is J stands for Jandan, which is essentially opening bank account for the unbanked. So almost 50 million bank accounts have been opened over the last three, four years for people, the families who were not actually into the formal system of uh, financial inclusion. You have JAM, J, A as Aadhaar, which is the digital identity platform. And then you have mobile. And we actually were able to leverage this three unique things and build something called UPI, which is a fascinating platform. Uh, UPI is United Payment Interface, and actually you can transfer money from one person to another person in in a Jiffy without actually having. You just need to know his UPI ID, and the money goes. And it's a real time settlement. Uh, 1.3 billion transactions happen on this platform. It's a very recent platform. It happened only over two years ago. 1.3 billion transactions happen every month. Almost, uh, I think about three billion. 3 billion US dollars worth of transactions happen on this platform. All are small transactions. All the small kiosks, all the small shops, all small service providers, they all have started accepting. This has become universally acceptable. And it is a dimension of inclusiveness that if you make something which is very easy to use. And that's why I said blockchain becomes very attractive because blockchain has the potential, and I am very fond of this, it has the potential to actually formalize the unformal. The informal. So you have in in a country like India, you have a large sector of economy which is informal. You have large section of uh, economic activity happening which is in for in the informal sector. And if you really want to make them 
everybody borrows but how many actually are able to go to a financial institution to borrow because they don't have a credit history it's not that they have never borrowed it doesn't mean that they don't have a credit history they do have a credit history but it's written in some piece of paper by some individual who has lent money to some person in a village so how do you bring it together and i think having an infrastructure and one of the things we are proposing and we are working on for the government of tamil nadu is creating a blockchain infrastructure for the entire common infrastructure something similar to what epsi does uh, the european blockchain service infrastructure to create this common infrastructure and prior to this session i was oh, i mean i joined a bit early so i was listening to them and somebody said that blockchain is no fun unless you have the whole uh, whole whole uh, uh, network of friends and network of families and and network of individuals and people who are interconnected in the continent outside the continent on as part of this so we are proposing to build this uh, blockchain as an infrastructure which will be used by the government departments of course it will have all the privacy preserving features it will have consent strong consent mechanisms and it will be opening up to the private sector as well that's what we are uh, proposing and in fact it touches upon your how the future economies will be so i think you will have future economies which are contactless which are which are uh, going to benefit a lot from this networking effect and they are going to deliver services on demand anytime anywhere you don't have to really wait or uh, uh, to, to for a government office to open uh, because i'm most familiar in this space so i talk about this you don't really have to wait for a particular uh, document to be available it will be made available all the time you have you have in india we have another concept has come in called digi lockers where all the important documents which you own uh, which uh, are are actually pushed to it when there is a legislative amendment which has been brought in which essentially says that anything which is produced digitally is valid of course to include to, to include and exploit the full potential of blockchain there are couple of uh, further legal changes which will be required but a bulk of the need of legal backing which blockchain uh, requires is already there in their information technology act i think it's written in the law of society so before we before we leave this topic you had mentioned something in the prep call that i hadn't heard about before but i think will be of great interest which has to do with kind of the idea of predictive services uh as opposed to reactive services can you just briefly explain what that refers to thank you jeff yes and and that's what i was saying so you you have this i mean the the vision is and the way we are uh moving forward is that you should have access to everything which you have i mean just like today if i want to transfer money to my uh, uh, my parents or if i if if i need to send money to my child i can do it at the midnight without any problems same thing i think uh, particularly in the government domain i think we need to move and we are moving in that service in that direction where we actually do not need people to actually come and knock at the doors of the government offices so we call this uh, and in fact this is a very ambitious project which we got just got the government approval uh, it's called predictive service delivery so while you have all these services available to you by the by the virtue of the fact that we have all these information connected together uh, if if we know that you are going to need these services as we go along as the child is born there are certain number of services which you need every uh six months i mean immunization it can be uh, you know aadhar enrollment which is your digital identity your uh, enrollment in the in the preschool uh, your enrollment in the school i mean all these services are required that's that's uh, that's uh, remarkable we're a bit up up, up against it in terms of uh of time so i'm just going to uh take a one question that came in from the audience and then we'll uh we'll, we'll look to uh, kind of get everybody's final thoughts on a couple of things So there's a question uh, directed for uh, Michael about uh, scaling, um, and uh, you know the, the 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 question or the comment is that you know is it the case that scaling can only happen in a controlled private environment? Um, can there be uh, public scaling, or or do we need to think about a hybrid model of uh, scalability? And you know I think this person may yeah. be getting at you know scalability trilemma or what. <laughs> Yeah. So and and when I um, so here's the here's the thing too. So like the um, what I'm so what I'm focused on when I'm talking about scale again is we're talking about um, systems for uh, the transfer of value. And, rem- and just just quickly, just remember when I was talking about scale again, um, it's not that. Uh, remember when we're talking about blockchain and financial markets, right? And the platforms of the future. Blockchain 
it's not that currently our financial markets are paper based, right? That, that's an illusion. There is some paper based, but you know, the majority of things that are happening on the mass scale, like, you know, buying an equity, right? Buying a stock, right? On a, on a website like E-Trade or something like that. Um, it's all digitized. Um, but here's the thing, right? What do we, what do we do in financial market infrastructure and financial markets? We take well understood legal structures, meaning an equity is a legal structure, right? A bond is a legal structure. We take these well understood, well litigated legal structures, and we scale them right with systems of for trading and settlement, um, and that basically becomes scaled. Now, here's the thing, right? Um, it's not that the current status quo was specifically developed with some um, with some ulterior motives in mind to keep power centralized necessarily. It's just that, you know, if you think about economies, right, they're kind of core to countries, sovereignty. And if you think about, you know, politicians, right, they stay in power because they create stable societies, right? So, you know, the things that scale need to um, respect law and order, need to protect investors, right? Need to not be subject to market manipulation, need to um, ensure that all people receive information in the same way at the same time. So. Um, when we talk about scale, I think uh, so long as, uh, so I think it's both, to answer your question, I think it's both, it's not true decentralization in the respect of like, okay, it's going to be this, you know, like Bitcoin style blockchain, which actually, if you look at it, actually has governance, right? Because the stakeholders, the miners, right, are actually stakeholders. And there is a form of governance there, right? And it's incentivized by the very reward you get for mining. But um, I think, you know, if you look at, like um, if you're tying a system to law, right, in a legal jurisdiction, right, then uh, ultimately there will be some need for private privatized centralization in order to uh, in order to set the rules of governance in place. Because you look, the technology systems we use to scale anything fail; they go wrong, right? You need recourse, legal recourse. Everyone wants legal recourse. So I think it. At best, it could be a hybrid of both, but not completely decentralized independent because it needs to map back to law and it needs to map back to jurisdiction because that's where like the whole concept of ownership and litigation comes from, right? So if you, cause like, just ask yourself this, right? When you buy a, an asset digitally, and I know if, when you buy an asset digitally, what are the actual legal rights underlying this? What, what does it confer upon me, the holder? What happens? like? You know, in the example of a stable coin, like what happens if they run off with the money in the bank account? I've got the stable coins, but I'm left with like, I'm basically left with vapor money, right? So we always have to think about that with scale. And I think in a technical sense to implement that, one must implement it in a centralized fashion, and then you can give access and extend it further out to um, new participants, right? So new platform companies, right? So greater numbers of people have access to the same services that fewer have access to today. That's great. Thank, thanks, Michael. And, and yeah. for the uh, for, for the last for the last word, um, as we're uh, we're uh, up against it in terms of time, uh, go to uh, Kyrat. Um, what new initiatives or developments uh, have you seen that you were the most excited or optimistic about? <clears throat> you mean uh, in Kazakhstan or over the world? I mean, uh, up to you. Up to you. Yeah. So. Uh, thanks for the question. So I think that uh, first of all, with, uh, what government uh, should focus on is uh, uh, it's, it's a regulation. So uh, we think. So I here I agree with Michael. So because everything, uh, every technology is like when it when it's scaling, when it's developing, facing legal issues, <clears throat> and it's 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 uh, like it should be because. Uh, 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 regulation, laws, and uh, all this legal uh, uh, legal side of, of, of developing business and scaling is very important because um, uh, it's protecting customer rights, investor rights, and uh, so it, it, it shouldn't be technology because of technology only. So. But uh, for, uh, what I would mention is that uh, regulation uh, for technology is uh, nowadays moving much faster than, than the regulation does. And uh, what I think is that the regulation should be more flexible and uh, a very uh, uh, working approach, uh, which uh, most of uh, developed countries 
uh, use is the sandbox approach and uh, not uh, on financial uh, uh, industry only, but uh, like regulation and different, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, autonomous uh, autonomic cars, uh, etc. So it's not it's it's all about uh, regulation. How how government uh, have to regulate, for example, this autonomic cars uh, driving on the street uh, where people go. Uh, second one, second uh, big uh, challenge uh, uh, for all, for most of government, especially in developing countries, is infrastructure, uh, both. Uh, uh, hard infrastructure, uh, for example, internet coverage, um, etc., and soft infrastructure, um, uh, hard, uh, like how it should work, uh, uh, developing it, etc. Uh, and third one, I think that uh, uh, governments in, in, in most of the countries should facilitate this development because uh, the society now is like it's it's kind of flexible but uh, it should some stimulus uh, to change and i think that uh, from this uh, uh, side of view is, uh, this pandemic is is very uh, is very good cause and uh, it's kind of facilitating this these changes and uh, from from this side of view it, it's positive impact of, uh, of covid uh, and uh, we also mentioned a collaboration uh, uh, between uh, countries in, for, in, for, uh, in this dimension, uh, especially in regulation, because uh, usually regulation in different countries uh, like cause that uh, some changes uh, goes quicker in one country and covers uh, probably you know, not big amount of people, but um, yeah. and cannot be like scaled in, in, in another country. And I think that regulators in different countries can have to collaborate closely. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you very much, Kairat. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all, all the panelists for their insights today. There's, there's so much uh, to discuss. We've learned of planes of competition, predictive services, topics of scale and collaboration. Uh, a lot for all of us to uh, mull over uh, as we continue with this conference and our lives over the next couple of days. Uh, but we'll leave it there. Thanks very much to everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much to all participants. Bye -bye. Thank you, Jeff.